I want to quickly show you why sons of God are fallen angels in Genesis 6. There are a couple of other views, of course. Once that the sons of God are the sons of Seth or the daughters of Cain. But if you read the text, it distinguishes sons of God from humans, that is, the daughters of men. The other view is that these are sons of powerful, some say demon-possessed tyrants or kings, earthly kings who thought, who thought they were gods. But again, the phrase, as we will see, sons of God always equals angels in the Old Testament. And also note that the progeny, the children of this mixing of sons of God with the daughters of men, are called the Nephilim, or the giants, and they're called angels in Daniel 4. In the Greek version from Theodosian, they're actually called the Watchers. The same title used in the literature known as the Books of Enoch, where this whole story is also told in more detail as well. Every time you see this same phrase throughout the Old Testament, you'll see that it's referring to angelic beings, not human beings. So you have Job, sons of God came to present themselves to the Lord God, and among them was Satan. Again, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And then you have the Psalms. Give unto the Lord, O sons of God, the glory due to his name. Who among the sons of God is like the Lord? So you can go and check, and I hope you do research that phrase, but uh, it always means angels. And again, the morning stars reference is interesting in Job chapter 38 as sons of God, and that's noted by, uh, by many Bible commentaries. And there I have the New English Translation Bible. In the book, The Letters of Second Peter and Jude, we should note at this point that Judaism abandoned this interpretation of Genesis 6 as referring to angelic beings only after the time of Rabbi Simeon in the third generation, so that's around the second century, insisting thereafter that the sons of God were human beings rather than angels. In Christian circles, this interpretation of Genesis 6 as referring to angelic beings remained unanimous until the 3rd century and continued until the 5th century. Thus, the strangeness of the tradition to our ears does not mean that it was strange to Jude's readers. Now here, the writer's referencing the letter uh, known as Jude in the New Testament because they mention this episode in Genesis 6 as does uh, the letter of Peter. David go, goes on and says, after all, there's no example of any other Jewish interpretation of Genesis 6 from two or more centuries before Christ, the formation of the early part of the uh, formation first book of Enoch, to two centuries afterward. So this early understanding is reflected, of course, in the New Testament. So we have Second Peter, if God did not spare the angels who sinned but sent them to Tartarus in pits of gloom, he delivered them over to, give, to be kept for judgment. And something about this word Tartarus, by the way, it's in shell, that is the grave, and it's mistranslated as hell in various translations, as you see there. Shell is simply the place of the dead, the grave dome as the word is literally translated. And in Jude also, the angels did not keep or keep guard over their own rule. And that word in the Greek is referenced in Colossians 2.15 in reference to the principalities of the air, uh, ruled by the prince of the air, as Paul later says. They left their rulership, their dominion, that's why God has kept them in perpetual chains. In First Peter, they're shown as imprisoned spirits under gloomy darkness. That is the netherworld, that world of the dead shell. So look at it as a prison underground. 
in view of the judgment of the great day, and of course that's a reference to the great day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day of the resurrection. Like Sodom, Gomorrah, and the surrounding cities, those, that is, those angels, committed sexual immorality by going after different flesh. And that's an important Greek phrase there, of different flesh. So now, dominion there is an interesting word. In the Masoretic of Deuteronomy 32, it talks about the sons of Israel, but in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they're translated as angelos, sons of God, or guardian angels. So angels have a post, as it, as it were. So it's clear that the New Testament writers understood the incident of Genesis 6 as something uh, supernatural, a divine rebellion, if you will, that took place. So these beings, these uh, rebel angels, are in this prison underground awaiting the great day of the Lord, the, the day of judgment, whereby all intents and purposes, they will eventually be destroyed. Now, angels are, are not inherently immortal. We are, we are all conditioned by the status God gives us, who is the only one who is eternal, immortal. So we are, all creatures are given immortality. So that means that that can be taken away. So these angels who are currently alive, so they've been alive for thousands of years, they will eventually be destroyed by God himself. So this is obviously different than the holy angels who remain immortal because they remain in obedience to the one God who is the eternal, the immortal.